Hey, everybody, how's it going? This is Seth, and you're listening to the RE Tipster Podcast. So in this episode, I'm talking with a guy named Ryan Chaw. Ryan is, is an interesting guy because uh, he's been featured on Bigger Pockets and a number of other podcasts over the years. Um, he's got kind of a cool thing going. By most people's standards, Ryan's actually a pretty normal guy, working a normal job. And over the past few years, he's been able to build up a nice rental property portfolio that's bringing in over 10000 bucks a month in rental income. And in this conversation, we're going to talk about how he managed to do this and some of the important lessons he's learned along the way and how you can follow a similar roadmap if you want to create something similar for yourself. So... Ryan, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, thanks for having me on, Seth. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe in like 60 seconds or so, who is Ryan Shaw? Why don't you give us your backstory? Yeah, that's a great question. So I got started out actually being inspired from my grandpa. He bought a couple properties in the San Francisco Bay Area before Silicon Valley was even a thing. Mm -hmm. um, as we all know, the prices skyrocketed, rents went up, and Grandpa Cha was able to basically retire early. And not only that, but help cover his own living expenses and cover some of my college tuition and my brother's as well. So I realized that real estate is one of the best ways to create generational wealth. So I wanted to get started as soon as possible. I graduated with my pharmacy degree in 2015, and I worked two jobs retail and hospital pharmacy, because I really wanted to save up a lot of capital to be able to invest in as many properties as possible. So I bought my first house in 2016. It was a three bed, two bath. I got it for $262,000. I actually lost a lot of money on that property because I didn't do my due diligence, which we can definitely go over later. And then, uh, but I kept going at it and I bought one property per year. Over the course of four years, I was able to create a portfolio that makes $10,755 in rental income. And I'm actually just recently purchasing a fifth property that will bring me to about $13,910 in rental income. And actually, the rooms are almost all rented out already from August 2021 to August 2022. Is that like before expenses or after expenses or... That's gross rental income, but after expenses, it ranges from four thousand to five thousand dollars in cash flow. Okay, cool. See, so, yeah, I mean, depending on uh, what market you live in and what your you know monthly personal expenses are, I mean, that could feasibly be a full time income, depending on who you are. Oh yeah. So I'm actually just curious. This whole thing you mentioned about Silicon Valley, when did that go nuts and become like a super expensive market like did that start in the 80s or something or, or when did that uh like when did your grandpa buy the property and then when did it yeah did so he actually that's yeah uh, he actually bought it in the 50s and then i would say around the dot-com time the dot-com era when internet was really becoming a thing that's when a lot of the companies grew and it created a lot of jobs obviously so a lot of people wanted to move to that area and real estate market the real estate market follows the job market the uh, house prices go up when you have a lot of jobs and mm -hmm. so that's what happened to him he actually bought three properties in the bay area and he rented out a couple of them and then basically that rental income in increased and then the prices of the properties increased and he was able to retire early from that. And you might've already mentioned it, maybe I just missed it, but what year did you start officially buying like income producing properties? 2016. 2016. And okay. what I do is I do a rent by the room system. So that's how I'm able to actually make so much cash flow on such a small portfolio. I only have five properties um, or purchasing my fifth one that will be making $13,910 because I rent each room out for about $600 to $700 to college students. Like are all of your properties handled this way or just one or two of them or? They all are. And actually it kind of, one of my friends inspired me to do it. He basically bought a property when he was in college and he rented out the other bedrooms to his roommates and mm -hmm. the roommates were able to cover all of his living expenses. So he was able to live in the house for free. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, I could totally do this. So once I graduated, I was like, okay, I'll give this method a try. Mm -hmm. And, you know, lo and behold, now I'm Four years later, I've scaled it to six-figure portfolio because I was able to reinvest that cash flow and then also take out some of the appreciation on the property to in invest it as a down payment on the fourth and fifth property. Gotcha. 
So this is almost sort of like a form of house hacking, right? Where you're just... Uh, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like house hacking on steroids, basically, because mm -hmm. you're renting out each one of the bedrooms. You're trying to create as many bedrooms as possible to mm -hmm. maximize your profit. So I'll usually take like a three-bed, two-bath, convert it to at least a four-bed, two-bath, uh, sometimes a five bed, two bath. And sometimes I'll actually put a couple into one of the rooms, like the master bedroom, and I'll be able to charge about 30% more rent by doing that. Mm -hmm. So I'll charge maybe something like $900 for the whole bedroom instead of the usual 620 or 650. Are these all single family houses? Is that the idea? Yeah, they're all single family homes okay. as well. So it's it's very simple to get into this market for someone to, you know, just starting out, I would say it's one of the best markets to get into because you're not going to be able to go and purchase like multifamilies and apartments unless you have a whole team of investors or do a syndication or something like that. But for the mom and pop people who just want to get started on a single family home, this is the best way to maximize your profits, essentially. Mm -hmm. If you were to just take one of these houses as an example, mm -hmm. like it sounds like pretty clearly it's a lot more lucrative to rent out houses by the room instead of just renting the whole house to one tenant. Um, what is the right. comparison? Like what is it under scenario A versus scenario B? Yeah, so I'll tell you actually for the numbers on my fifth rental, um, I have them here. So I'm going to be renting it out for $34.40 per month because I have a couple in the master bedroom and then I have five other tenants or sorry i have four other tenants plus a couple so six tenants total so it's going to be three thirty four forty and then i looked it up on rentometer.com and per rentometer i should be only getting one thousand five hundred thirty seven dollars mm. per, gotcha. per this house so i'm essentially doubling my rental income yeah, that's, on that's a properties. huge difference is it like a prerequisite or I don't know, does it only make sense to do this around like a college town or could you just pick any random city or town and make this work? Like, Yeah, so I have some people I teach this method to and they've actually been able to diversify a little bit. So we kind of target uh, cities that have high job prospects, like high paying jobs. Uh, so for like tech companies, as an example, we also target places that have like government workers because government workers, they have a very stable job. They have a lot of benefits. So you're not going to worry about getting unpaid rent. And then of course, targeting colleges um, and then healthcare workers actually. So just being close to a lot of medical centers allows you to target healthcare workers. And we all know healthcare workers, even during COVID they're in high demand and their you know, income is quite high as well. So, Does that mean they're like okay. transient healthcare workers, like they're in town for a few months and then they're leaving, or like they literally live there long term and just rent a bedroom? We target long term, uh, okay. but I do know some people who are trying the traveling nurse model where they just rent out to traveling nurses for a couple months at a time so they can make a higher income. But then, of course, you have a higher uh, potential for vacancy. So, when I think about the type of tenant who would want to do this. Are these people like all sharing a kitchen and bathroom together with people that they don't previously know? And they're just kind of cool with that because they're saving a lot of money on rent. Is that like the kind of person you're going after? Is somebody who's flexible like that? Exactly. So if you think about it, normal people, when they go into college first year or second year, they'll stay at the dormitories. And usually they're staying like with their bunk mate and maybe there's like a bunk bed, right? And then they all share this communal bathroom so staying at one of my houses is actually a huge upgrade because you have your own privacy. You have access to the rest of the house, the backyard. There's a lot more room, essentially. Plus, you're paying half the price of what the dormitories charge. Dormitories usually charge $1,100, $1,300 per month. Plus, you have to buy this meal plan, which basically forces you to purchase meals from the university. And obviously, the university does have a a little bit of a premium to you know their meals mm -hmm. so they're essentially paying half the price getting a lot more privacy and they're just as close to their classes my houses are within a five minute walk to campus mm -hmm. or five minute walk to classes so yeah. it makes sense for a lot of people to, to save money on you know student housing uh, to save money on their student loans so are your units specifically are those all rented to college kids or is it sort of a mix of college and then other types of people? They are. Um, because of COVID, I did branch out a little bit. So I did rent out to some college alumni. So recent grads who got a job. Mm -hmm. And I was totally, 
that was perfectly fine too. I was able to get a lot, you know, my place fully occupied. Um, even during COVID, I gave out some discounts. So I was making around $9,300 per month. Mm -hmm. Now it's back up to, you know, 10,700. But again, I kind of had to pivot during COVID because uh, we were worried the college was going online. They're all online classes, but I did retarget towards more alumni, you know, young professionals type as well. And I was able to fully rent it out yeah. because I was pushing for it. You know, I was, I was reaching out there. I was also getting on calls with people as well to see if they're comfortable, what they like to see at the property, uh, what amenities can we provide and that type of stuff. Again, just going back to the type of tenant who would be looking for this kind of arrangement. Does it make a lot of sense to do this in cities where like rent is just crazy expensive, like New York City or San Diego or San Francisco, that kind of thing? Like I think about if I were to try to do this in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I'm at, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure I could find somebody to do it, but it, it seems like there would be more people looking for this in areas where rent is just like nuts. Is that accurate or am I misguided? It depends on, on the price to rent ratio, right? So if you have a city where the prices are very high, as long as you can put like a 20% down payment on a house there, if the rents are very high and even the, the price of the house is very high, as long as the rents cover the mortgage plus gives you additional cash flow, the deal will make sense. Mm -hmm. I got you. Right. So this can be done. Actually, I've, I've seen this done in San Jose. Uh, one of my uh, students is actually going to is investing in San Jose. He's buying a house that's like a million dollars, but the rent for each room is twelve hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And he has eight bedrooms and he's already have it fully rented out with, uh, you know, eight tenants. So that's ninety six hundred dollars in rental income, mm -hmm. which totally covers the mortgage. Yeah. Say if you have uh, a mix of college students versus, you know, medical professionals or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is it more ideal, ideal to keep all the college students in one building and the other types of people in another building? So you don't have a mix of college versus, you know, professional people. Yeah, definitely. So what I would do is I collect all these rental applications, right. And I'll kind of group them up together. So I'll have like a house that's mainly pharmacy students, a house that's dental students, a house that's pre-pharmacy, you know, a house of music students or engineering students. And I kind of group them up based off of interest. So they kind of vibe together very well. And is there some kind of rule about how many unrelated people you can have living together under one roof? Is that Yes, right? definitely. So this is where you have to check with your local city laws. So what you want to do is give your city planning division a call. It's called the city planning division and basically ask them how many people of unrelated households can I have in one room and how can I do this where I rent out by the bedroom or rent out to a couple and all that. So for me in my city, as long as I have a city business license and pay the city tax on that, and I think the tax is very low. I think it was only like 100 or $200 for a six-figure rental portfolio, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's totally worth it. And I was able to do multiple leases per household, uh, unrelated tenants, all of that is perfectly legal as long as I have that business license. But again, it depends on the city. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have a business license for my city, you can do a maximum of only two leases per house because i remember this issue coming up a lot when i was in college first thinking about doing exactly what you're doing is this mm -hmm. whole issue of oh no you can't do more than that kind of thing and at the time <laughs> i was just like well i guess i can't do it and i moved on <laughs> but i guess i oh, yeah. made a phone call maybe it would work out so. well sometimes you have to just talk to the right people because yeah. um i've definitely talked with people who said no you can't do it but then once i called the planning division those are the guys in charge right so if you mm -hmm. talk to the guy in charge and they say it's okay then, you know, get in a writing if you can, obviously. Yeah. But if they say it's okay, then yeah, it's perfectly legal. And does each individual tenant, like per room, do they send you a separate check or make a separate payment to you each month? Or do they all pool their funds together and make one payment? Or how does that, how, the, how does the payment processing part work? You can definitely have either option, to be honest. But what I do is have individual 
uh, payments. So basically they'll download the Zelle app and Zelle is a direct deposit app. It'll tell you exactly when they pay. So I know if they paid late and everything and I can keep track very easily because it'll, it'll list their name next to their rental payment. Mm -hmm. So I have them each on individual leases and individual payments. For utilities, however, you can have utilities under one of the tenants names. And I've done this uh, quite a few times where basically all the utilities are under one tenant's names and then they'll split the bill among the other tenants. So they'll pay me the utilities and then they'll charge back the other tenants. Is there, uh, is there any advantage to using like an app or some kind of software that's specifically designed for rent collection, like a Cozy or a Avail or a Tenant Cloud or something like that? You know, I didn't see the need for it. I just use Excel sheets because I like keeping track of my finances myself, trying to see like what comes in, what goes out. So I know my, you know, expenses and my income and my cash flow very well. Mm -hmm. um, so I just use Excel to keep track. But for those who aren't so savvy, you can definitely hire like a bookkeeper um, or use one of those rental apps that keeps track of it for you. And are you getting... Like, I guess, in cases where you're allowed to do more than two leases per uh, household. So mm -hmm. you have an, each individual tenant sign their own individual lease. And is that like an annual yeah. lease or month to month? Or how's that working? That's right. So if you have a business license, you can actually have multiple leases per household. It, it, there's no limit, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I do have them sign individually. And if possible, try to get a parent co-signature as well. Okay. To gotcha. Protect yourself. If one of these tenants just decides to stop paying you or something, what does that eviction process look like? Is that is that weird because there there's one tenant in one room, but the others are fine? You have to like get in there, and have some awkward confrontation, or I don't know. Is there anything different about that than normal? So the that cool, the yeah. So the cool part about this model is actually you don't. That's probably one of the least of your worries. Um, I've actually never run into that problem because the tenants are, or sorry, the parents are paying the rent. So what parent is going to stop paying rent and have their child evicted from the place they're staying at in college, right? Mm -hmm. Parents are pretty responsible for their children. Also, the student has several ways to make the payment. They could either take out a student loan to pay cover their housing expenses. They can take out financial aid. They can, you know, again, have their parent do that as well. So as long as I get proof of income from the parent, I'm comfortable with these people being able to pay the rent and not having to deal with eviction. And that's a, is that some kind of requirement then where like the parent has to be ready to make that payment before you'll sign a lease with somebody? Yeah, definitely. You gotcha. always have to have proof of income no matter what. So you gotcha. have to show an income source that okay. you, that you feel is comfortable enough to cover the rent and yeah. then other expenses. Yeah, I guess that is one differentiator about renting to students is that this just the financial situation is kind of different in terms of where they can get money in. It's not like they necessarily rely on a yeah. job because they have a student loan or a parent, like you're saying. So exactly, yeah. So are there any other issues to watch out for when you're doing this type of rent by room model? Every once in a while you'll have, I would say one time per year, I'll have it at like one of my houses where a tenant might not be happy with another tenant. So they'll complain, of course, and there'll be some drama. And what I'll say is I'll basically empower them saying, you know, you're an adult now. Why don't you go ahead and talk with them one on one, face to face, mm -hmm. have a discussion, come up with an actionable plan, implement that plan. And if it's still not working out between you two, you can come back and talk to me. But every time I've done that, I haven't had issues afterwards. The good thing about this market is if you still have problems after that, you can actually go to their authority figure, right? One of their parents and say, hey, this is what's going on. Maybe the tenant is playing like really loud music or something like that, disturbing the other tenants. That's violation of the lease, right? So you explain it to the parent. And then after that, you know, you're not going to have any problems. This is strictly a part-time thing for you, right? It's not like you're doing this as your full-time job. It's kind of a side source of income. Is that accurate? Oh, yeah, definitely. I would say I would spend an average of less than an hour a week mm -hmm. on this whole process because I have systems in place. So having the right team in place, having the right processes in place, make this whole um, thing easier. And nowadays, it's not even hard for me to fill my bedrooms because I just rely on a referral system. I have 18 tenants, soon to have 28 tenants. 
And so each of those tenants knows another three or five friends that might potentially want to stay at the house. So I have potentially, I don't know what's 30 times five, 150 people interested in staying at my house. Mm -hmm. Right. So nowadays it's like very simple to get referrals and very simple to get my rooms filled. In fact, my, my uh, school has 5,000 uh, students and if you take 28 divided by 5,000 that's like less than one percent of the total market share so mm-hmm. this is a very good niche market and it makes a lot of sense for the students because they're saving at least six hundred dollars in rent payments mm-hmm. right and they don't have to pay a meal plan and they're very close to school so yeah. I think it's what you call a blue ocean market basically an untapped market untapped potential a lot of people um I mean, there's some people who get into it, but I feel like there's a lot more to be had here. Are there ever issues with like vacancies in the summer when school's out and people are gone? Or is that not really an issue? It is if you do a nine month lease. So what I do is a minimum of a one year, 12 month lease. And what they can do is always sublease it during the summer. And because I have this referral system going on, and plus I have targeted marketing, I'm able to help them sublease it, find someone to sublease it to. So mm-hmm. it's not an issue. Gotcha. So do you have to advertise these these rooms for rent at all? Or like it's just kind of handled from the word of mouth thing? Nowadays, I don't as much. But uh, like I said, uh, I do actually have this. Uh, it's called the prime method mm-hmm. for marketing for tenants. And we can definitely go over it. It's basically my method to find high quality tenants, consistent high quality tenants. So the mm-hmm. P stands for placement of your ads. You want to place your ads where your target market hangs out. Putting up ads where your target tenants don't hang out is basically like fishing in an empty pond, right? So the first thing I did when I started out, I actually put a four red sign on my lawn and I put my number there. That was a big mistake. I got calls from all sorts of people. None of them were students. A lot of them were asking for cheaper rent because they're like, what? I have to pay $2,500 for the whole house for my family. Mm -hmm. It's usually $1,500. But I'm like, no, it's rent by the room, you know? So it was definitely not the right set of tenants. Um, So you kind of have to figure out where do your you know, college students hang out. Maybe it's campus bulletin boards, right? Maybe it's Facebook groups, uh, Craigslist. Those are just some examples. Mm -hmm. Uh, The R stands for reviewing social media. So once they contact you, you do want to review their social media. Look for things like what type of tenant are they? Like, are they a partier? Do you see a lot of drugs and smoking and alcohol in their pictures? Then you're less likely, I would say I'm less likely to invite them into the household because I don't want a house party going on, obviously. Mm -hmm. The I stands for identifying type of tenant. So are these Is this a tenant who's constantly asking for cheaper rent? Do they get angry easily? Um, Are they easy to communicate with? Or is there like a barrier to communication? Um, That type of stuff. And then M stands for measuring responsiveness. I find the more responsive a tenant is, the more responsible they are. So if they're getting their paperwork back pretty quickly, then I can tell that this guy's pretty mature he's pretty professional and if I bring him into the household he'll be able to help me out around the house so what's really great about having the system is you have four or five tenants that you can rely on instead of seeing them as four or five problems I see them as four or five helpers each one of them could help me get things done around the house like changing a light bulb I've actually had a tenant who installed a security camera on his own without even asking and you know, just to protect the property. The final letter is E, which is ensuring proof of income. I usually get the last two month bank statements and a credit score to make sure that they can pay the rent. So it sounds like when you're starting off, this kind of advertising and stuff is pretty necessary. I mean, do you have to do it at all anymore? Just kind of sporadically or? I do put up ads because the more leads, the better, Mm -hmm. right? Why, why reject a lead? And I try to keep my volume of applicants as wide as possible. It's kind of like a funnel, right? At the top of your funnel, your marketing funnel, you want a lot of people interested contacting you, filling out the rental app and all that. And then you kind of narrow it down. You start asking, okay, what type of tenant are they? Are they going to be professional, mature? Are they going to potentially give me problems um, on the house, right? Mm -hmm. And then I narrow it down even further, making sure that they can pay the rent. And at the very end, I only have a couple tenants signing each lease. Now, I'm curious, if somebody doesn't want to manage all this themselves, like they want to own properties like this, 
because they can obviously make twice as much rent, but they don't want to be the hands-on property manager. Is there a, like a type of property manager that does this kind of thing? Or do you sort of have to be your own PM if you're going to get From what I've been hearing, a lot of property managers try to avoid it. I do know some property managers who do do it, but then they charge a significant amount and they'll take out of your cash flow. Mm -hmm. But what you can do, and eventually I'll probably be doing this, is um, outsource this all to a virtual assistant. So mm -hmm. someone who can do the bookkeeping, keep track of the finances, keep track of the rent and the utilities being paid. Or again, you could use something like tenant cloud. Um, and then once that's done and you just have to take care of if something breaks down on the house. So if something breaks down, what happens is usually a tenant will text me like the toilet's broken. I'll forward that to one of my handymen or contractors and the handymen know to get in there quickly. They know my expectation is to get it done within a week or so, you know, and be responsive there. And I, I do hire them for quite a few jobs, right? So they, they value our relationship. And so you have that network there. It, it allows you to basically lead this whole self-management thing uh, with a hands-off approach. So if somebody doesn't want any part in self-management, is this sort of not for them, would you say? Or is there any other way? I would say so. No, I mean, you can, like I said, you can definitely hire out if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, for the people who it's not for, I would say if you're not willing to persevere if you, you know, quit easily, if you let an obstacle get to your head and you don't have the right mindset to basically, if you encounter a huge loss and you don't have the right mindset, then this thing is going to be really difficult for you. I think in all real estate though, that's not just this market, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. when COVID hit, right, I started getting into my own head, like, oh, am I even going to get tenants? But I, again, I persevered through it. I um, started reaching out. I started getting creative. How else can I advertise my rooms? How else can I leverage my network to fully occupy my property? And I was able to, of course, fully occupy the property throughout the whole COVID period. Yeah, I know there's a pretty common thing. I remember I was thinking that I think probably anybody, if they're honest, was probably worrying about like, what is COVID going to do to me, you know, a year ago when this all kind oh, yeah. of started unraveling. And uh, so basically it hasn't really had any negative impact on you. Again, I offered some discounts. So my rental income went from 10,700 to 9,300, but I was still covering all my mortgages and I have a, a couple thousand in cash flow still. So it still worked out for me. Mm -hmm. And again, that was because I pushed for it, right? Mm -hmm. I had that drive, I reached out, I started getting on calls with people. Kind of going back to your first deal and your second deal and your third one, how did you find these? Were these anything, were these just like on the MLS or did you find them off market or were they like, it sounded like they were decent deals, right? It's not like you're, you know, yeah. offering over asking price or anything like that. So like, what did you do to find these things? Yeah. So the first couple of deals were actually MLS and um, Zillow. So right, right when it pops up on Zillow, I basically forward that to my real estate agent and say, hey, can I look at this house? But my real estate agent, he also has a network in the area. So he does find off-market listings. So the one that I purchased this year, the fifth property, I actually found off-market and below market price. So I got it for 340000 and appraised for 360000 And we know that when all these properties hit the market, they go for, especially in California, they go for 50,000, you know, up to a hundred thousand dollars over asking price. And these yeah. people are paying cash yet. I was still able to get this property off market for below the appraisal price. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because I established this, you know, connection with my real estate agent. I actually cut them checks after each uh, property, even though I'm not the seller, I, I do cut him a check to thank him for his work. And he knows exactly what I'm looking for. And he knows I can close on every deal that I put an offer on. So he, he will, you know, of course, do me a favor as well and find me properties that are off market because these real estate agents, they, you have to realize they do their own advertising as well. They do reach out to uh, potential sellers in the area and they say, hey, if you want to sell your home, you can sell it through us, right? And mm -hmm. so they do encounter a lot of off-market deals. And if they know what your criteria is, they can keep an eye out for it. And so basically this property popped up and he was like, oh, 
this is perfect for Ryan because he looks for a three bed, two baths with uh, potential to add bedrooms. And this one looks like it has potential to add bedrooms. So, and it's also like five minute walk from campus or three minute walk actually for this one. And he's like, okay, this is perfect property for Ryan. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it to him. Yeah. In terms of the ability to add bedrooms, are you essentially just looking for like, is there enough space in the basement or could I take this bedroom and chop it in two? Is that basically what you're looking for? Or are you actually talking general, about adding onto the building? Yeah, the general rule is actually, yeah, the, the general rule is definitely don't add onto the building. That'll cost a lot more. It, the general rule though is if you're 1200 square foot or more, you can add a fourth bedroom. If you're 1500 square foot or more, you can add, sorry. 1200 or more, you can add a fourth bedroom, 1500 or more, you can add a fifth bedroom. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I look for and usually I'll look for like uh, extra family room or living room or office space that I can easily convert into a bedroom just by repurposing it and putting in some furniture, maybe making it a little bit more private. Um, or I'll split like a living room in half where half of it will become a bedroom, the other half will remain the living room, as long as it's a large enough living room. What is the limit on how small a room can be to be a bedroom? 70 square foot uh, with a minimum width of seven foot. And okay. the height, I think is, uh, it depends on the, the state. I think it's actually seven or eight foot. Uh, right now, California, you usually have a little bit less cash flow, but you have very, very good depreciation. Mm -hmm. For example, my very first house I purchased over the course of five years, it went up $130,000. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty massive appreciation. I think that's $25,000 a year. Yeah, and huge. I like to, to do that because you can still use that, that equity on that property. You can take it out using a HELOC or a cash out refi, and that allows you to scale that much further. So California is actually a great market for me because I can maximize my profits uh, by using this rent by the room method. And I'm definitely covering the mortgage and getting at least a thousand dollars or $1,500 or more in cash flow per house. And how exactly did you finance each each of these properties? Was this just a conventional mortgage or did you do some other creative way of financing them? Yeah, conventional loans, because if you are an employee or W-2 worker, that's probably your best bet to get financing. It's the cheapest out there. I think interest rates are anywhere from like 2.8 to maybe 4% on an investment property. Um, so it's honestly the best financing out there for those who are W-2 workers. Usually once you get into the self-employed area, you have to get more creative and you have to use more like portfolio lenders, you know, private money, that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, but for me, I conventionally financed them. But um, for one of them, I actually took out, I got a bit creative and took out a HELOC. The fourth property, I took out a HELOC from my first property because it went up 130000 and I was able to use that towards the down payment on the fourth property. And I'm also going to use that same HELOC for the fifth property as well. Mm -hmm. So when I, I basically joked that when I bought the first house, I basically bought my fourth and fifth house as well. And you were able to do that mainly because of the appreciation thing, right? Yes, exactly. And I didn't have to use any of my own money. I just used the rental income equity pay down plus depreciation on the property to do that. So let me just like give a quick example. If you were to do a HELOC on a hundred thousand dollar property, you can do up to 80% loan to value. So what that means is you multiply 80% by the property price, the current price. So 80% times a hundred thousand is $80,000. And let's say you have $50,000 left, left on your loan. What you do is just, you subtract that 80,000 minus the 50,000 that leaves you with 30,000 that you can take out as a HELOC. So yeah. that's the basic calculation. And if you do this on your property, you might be surprised actually, especially in this market right now, a lot of properties appreciated in price because it's a hot market. You can use that equity um, to basically purchase wherever you want. And the good thing about the HELOC is if you keep it at zero balance, you don't have to pay anything on it. You know, four, five, six percent interest on zero dollars is still zero dollars. So you can use it whenever you want. But it's just having the access, that ability to take out, you know, 30, 40, 
$80,000 and only being charged, you know, a 4%, 5%, 6% interest rate on it. Mm -hmm. And then using that money to make a return because the number one purpose of money is to make more money or should mm -hmm. be to make more money, right? Yeah. So if you are taking a HELOC, let, let's say $80,000 out at a 5% interest, but you're able to put in a property that makes a uh, 13%, 15% cash on cash return, it just makes a whole lot of sense because yeah, totally. you know, you're know you you're netting a 10% return still. So at some point when that HELOC is totally tapped out, do you want to then term that out as a normal amortizing mortgage or? So there's a 10 year draw period usually. And then after that it becomes, aim, like you said, amortized. Oh, just automatically? Amortized. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So if property values weren't appreciating like crazy like they have been, would you not have been able to do this? Well, California appreciates no matter what, yeah, that's <laughs> to true. be honest. But I do recommend investing in emerging markets or near colleges that have high demand. So colleges that are like Ivy League colleges that have a lot of professional schools like pharmacy, medical schools, dental schools, nursing schools, those are always in high demand and they're constantly expanding as well. So more people obviously means more need for housing, meaning rents will go up and housing prices will go up. Yeah. An emerging market is basically a market that has a lot of job growth and population growth. Colleges that are expanding or tech companies moves like let's say, um, I don't know, Tesla moves to Texas, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the city that they move to, it'll probably create a lot of jobs. So you're mm -hmm. gonna see appreciation in the property prices and increases in rents. Yeah. So did you make any mistakes as you were starting to do this? Like what are some, oh, yeah. what are some things looking back that you would do differently or what would you warn other people about if they're looking to get into this kind of business model? Yeah, definitely. So I made a lot of mistakes on my very first property. I lost over $30,000 on it just in preventable items. Mm -hmm. So what happened is I would get, I got this call from a tenant. It was around 10 PM at night on the weekend. And he said, dude, there's sewage that's coming out of this kitchen sink. It's all over the kitchen floor. It's flooding into the basement now. And it's also coming out of the showers too. So I was like, oh man, what do I do? Right. So I, I called up all these uh, people who could sanitize it. Obviously it was hard to get someone out there. Um, the cost to sanitize it, clean up the mess, put a sump pump in the basement. It was over a couple thousand dollars. And then we stuck a camera down the pipe and found that there are roots sticking in the sewage pipe. So the whole line was broken, had to be replaced with PVC pipe, which cost me $9,000. Mm -hmm. So just that there was over 10,000 total. And then I realized that the HVAC unit was very old. It wasn't really working at all. So I replaced that whole thing for $15,000. So I had a lot of mistakes that I made on the first house, but if I did my due diligence, uh, such as just getting a sewage line inspection during the escrow phase of the house, I would have been able to see the pipe was already broken and had the roots sticking into it and had the seller pay for some of the costs or at least cut me a check at closing to cover, you know, future costs and potential breaks. It's just about finding, you know, looking out for those red flags, doing your due diligence, doing all the necessary inspections. Like if the roof is old, you know, do a roof inspection, right? Do you ever deal with properties that... Or like, would you ever deal with a property that needs a full rehab? Like it's just a mess of a property. It needs to be completely overhauled. Is that what you do or not really? That's not what you mess with. So the first house was the closest to that, obviously, because I had to redo the bathrooms because they're old. I put in a whole new HVAC unit. I had to put in a whole new sewage line. Um, I put in an, an extra bedroom. So that was a pretty big rehab project. Um, but I've never had to do like a complete fixer upper where the roof is not working. And plus you, you run into lending problems when you have huge fixer uppers because the banks are not really willing to lend on the property that they see as a liability. If they see too much wrong with the property, it's hard to get financing for it unless you do private equity, hard money, that type of stuff. So I mainly stick with properties that are mostly turnkey. Most things are in good conditions. I just have to add that four for fifth bedroom, maybe expand the bathroom a little bit. Um, but that's pretty much the extent of the work that I will mainly do on a house. Actually, um, going back to the financing stuff a little bit, 
Do banks ever have issues with you using properties for this specific use? Like you're you're not an owner occupant, you're renting them out by the room. Like it, just that alone, is that ever a problem? Or banks are like, yeah, we don't care, that's fine. Yeah, so they actually do like this thing where they take 70 per, 75% of your rental income and they use that towards your debt to income ratio. So I've actually never run into a debt to income ratio problem. Um, they actually don't have issues with rent by the room. As long as you're showing rental income coming in, doing that, you're fine, right? Mm -hmm. I don't even know if we talked about this, but what is your day job? Like, what is your career outside of this? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah. I'm a pharmacist. I was actually the first one in the healthcare field uh, from my family. So I'm very proud of that. And I learned as a pharmacist, you know, it's a great job. You're helping a lot of people. But I encountered this one elderly pharmacist. He kind of had this bad attitude, obviously. And I asked him, what do you like about your job? And he said, he whispered in my ear, like, to be honest, I would have quit a long time ago. I'm just here to collect the paycheck nowadays. Yeah. Um, but if I could have, you know, done it over again, I would have invested. Yeah. And I would have more choices and have that time freedom to basically choose how many hours I want to work here. Unfortunately, nowadays, I'm just collecting a paycheck. So I was like, okay, I don't want to be that pharmacist, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll work 10, 20 years. I don't know yet. Um, but at least I have that choice once I have financial freedom, which I'll actually, um, I'll have by around 31. Mm -hmm. I'll be able to make that choice. How many hours do I want to work as a pharmacist? And how much do I want to put towards making another impact or maybe a larger impact on the world that I, be, I want to make? I don't know what it is about that. Maybe it's a function of which pharmacy you work at. But every time I go to the pharmacy, if people I deal with, like they just, I can see it on their faces. Like they're just oh, yeah. stressed. Like they're not in a good place. And is that something you feel often in your job or is it, uh, maybe it, it just can takes be. It can be stressful. It depends on the workload, um, depends on how many patients come into the hospital, obviously. Um, I would say it's a very rewarding job because you're definitely helping people. But I would say at the same time, I don't see myself doing it for past, you know, 20 years or more. Yeah. Like I said, once I hit 31, I'll probably cut back my hours, maybe work pharmacy one or two or three days a week. And then from there, I'll probably just decide what kind of impact do I want to have on this world? Yeah. Right? What else can I contribute to? And one of the things I do, of course, is teach others my system for renting by the room, because honestly, I believe this is the best way to get started for someone new in real estate investing. And I want to expand that and, you know, lead more people towards that life of financial freedom if I can. Yeah. I don't know exactly what a pharmacist makes, but I think it's pretty decent. I mean, it's not, uh, it's on that upper end. Of, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and there's actually special pharmacist loans too. So if you're a healthcare professional, there's like pharmacy loans, nursing loans, doctor loans. And what's really cool about that is you don't have to pay PMI if you put less than 20% yeah. down sometimes. So that's something to for people to look into. I've also heard of loans for like first responders, for teachers, you know, just be resourceful. There's, there's a lot of different lending um, institutions out there and some specify, you know, specifically support a certain group or certain career. I look at your career as a pharmacist and what role does that play in your ability to get financing and buy these kinds of properties? Like if you were, you know, say if you're working minimum wage at McDonald's or something, is it safe to assume that would severely limit your ability to do what you've done? Like if, if somebody's listening to this and they're not a pharmacist, are they not going to be able to do this kind of thing because they don't have the same kind of income? If you're just working at McDonald's minimum wage, I would say it's a little bit harder because you have to make sure the debt to income ratio is high enough for banks to lend onto you. Mm -hmm. And the banks have to follow something called Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac requirements. And usually that's a debt to income ratio of 50% or less. I think they go up to 50% for some programs, uh, but you guys obviously have to do your research into that. But uh, as if you're not making a certain income threshold to however much you're going to pay on the mortgage, like if you're basically not able to cover that mortgage, it's going to be hard for you to get lending on that. Yes. So keep that in mind. Um, maybe work a second job like I did. When I was starting out, I worked six or seven days a week. I would work these double shifts so that I can get the best lending out there. In the banks, they don't really care about the rental income, right? What they care about is your personal income. 
Exactly. Yes, they do yeah. take into account the potential rental income, but it's not going to be the full thing. Again, if you use this rent by the room method, it's not going to, they're not going to say, oh, okay, we'll take that. No, they're going to take whatever rentometer tells them and then, you know, use that to determine, okay, what's the potential for your rental income. Right. But if you're showing, of course, you know, increased rental income from your properties on your tax returns and everything, yeah, they're going to take that into account. Does this do a good thing for your tax return each year? Like, does it severely minimize the amount of taxes you would otherwise have to pay because of depreciation and that kind of thing? Is that a notable advantage? I would advantage? definitely talk to your accountant about that because there is a bit of a balance. If you take too much deductions, too many expenses, claim too much expenses on your tax returns and you're showing basically like zero returns, the, the lenders are going to look at that and wonder, are you actually making any money from these properties, right? So it, it can affect your, how easy it is for you to get lending. So that's something definitely talk with an accountant about mm -hmm. uh, because you don't want to take like so much so that it looks like you're negative, right? Mm -hmm. Was there anything else you wanted to cover about your latest deal, your fifth deal in escrow right now? Definitely any? one of my best deals. Um, I got it for 340000 and we're going to put in another bathroom and then another bedroom. So it'll be five bedrooms total with six tenants. And so it's going to make $3,440 in rental income, which is really great. And this is like during a time when it's a really hot market. Mm -hmm. So again, just, you know, create that network, just start telling people that you're interested in investing in real estate, get in touch with a real estate agent. That's always the first step. And then go from there, see a couple of houses, uh, meet some of the neighbors around the area, grow your connections. And then, you know, eventually you'll be at a place where you kind of end up getting the best deals, getting really good rental income, and then you can scale it from there. Was well, there any, any other questions I should be asking you about this that we haven't covered yet? I think we covered most of it. Yeah. Just realize, you know, the best thing to do is just get started because real estate's a buy and then wait game, not a wait time to market and buy game. You can buy at any point in the market, you know, as evidence from me buying during this time. Um, if you just know the right people. And so what I would do is, you know, buy as soon as possible so you can like plant your seeds and then they'll eventually grow into trees, right? Because you gain equity, pay down, you gain appreciation on the property, you get rental increase on the property. You, inflation works in your favor because you're paying back your fixed mortgage with cheaper dollars each year. Um, so it gets easier and easier to pay back your mortgage. Plus you take all these deductions and taxes, you take depreciation, all of that type of stuff. So, you know, rental rentals make money in multiple ways, right? Not just the rental income. You have to realize that, but the best asset is your time. Yeah. So buying it as soon as possible and letting it grow over time will skyrocket you to success essentially. Awesome. I'm going to quick transition to the final three questions that we ask a lot of the guests that come on the podcast here. Mm -hmm. so the first question is, what is your biggest fear? Yeah, so it used to be fear of heights, uh, but then I went skydiving, so not so big anymore. Take care of that one, right? <laughs> uh, but I would say a big one used to be fear of judgment. Um, I would have this need like since childhood for validation from others but then i realized you know i should be confident in what i've done you know i i start looking back at what i've accomplished and i celebrate that and so i realized that you know i i can validate myself right mm -hmm. and i don't need to listen to how other people judge me and i don't have to worry like are they thinking that ryan's going to buy all these properties because he's greedy he's selfish you know to me it doesn't matter so much anymore because it's more about creating those connections with the people who do value you as a person, just as a human being and value, you know, what you're doing and eventually what you're going to do for the world. Yeah. Yeah. There was a guy named Albert Hubbard. He's got this quote where he says to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing and be nothing. <laughs> I always thought that was kind of, kind of a good one. Exactly. Yeah. You can never avoid criticism, right? Yeah. Everyone. <laughs> We will have some haters the more successful you become. So next question is, what are you most proud of? Mm, I would say just having a very close-knit group of friends. Um, to me, it's all about friends and family at the end, right? Who you connect with and how you connect with them on a deep level. I would say that's very important to me. Mm -hmm. 
And that, that's why I'm a proud of. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth being proud of for sure. So what is the most important lesson you have ever learned? Treat your team members well. So like for me, right, a real estate agent, I would cut him a check, right? Just as a thank you. And then as a return gift, he get, got me this really awesome off-market deal, right? Same mm -hmm. thing for your contractors and your tenants. Treat them well, and then they, they'll take care of you as well. If you're, you know, giving them um, some good work to do, and then you're, you know, of course, not pushing them too much, but you do make sure it's done in a timely manner and all that, you kind of create this nice relationship, business relationship, where they respect you, you respect them, and then you guys create win-win situations for each other because nowadays um, my contractors they're willing to do things at a little bit more of a discount versus you know charging me premium price for a lot of the jobs because i i have a lot of you know potential jobs for them especially when i because i purchase a house each year that's actually a huge lesson i I don't know that it's like always necessary to do that with everyone, but there's certain key team members that like you want, you want them to think of you first. Like if they're trying to decide who to take care of, they're going to take care of you because you're that special to them. And that's right. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. You want them on your side for sure. And rooting for you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I mean, I guess it sort of depends on what you need help with, but a lot of times good help is really hard to find. So like if you find somebody who's yeah. good at what they do, like, cling to them for dear life because <laughs> you can't just snap your fingers and find somebody amazing all the time oh yeah exactly exactly that's yeah. why it's so important to develop that connection with your team members yep so if people want to learn more about you is there a website they should go to or yeah, it's a uh, www.newbierealestateinvesting.com. And I offer a free PDF for those who are interested in getting into the student housing market or using this strategy or just getting started in real estate. Um, and you can find that out, out again at www.newbierealestateinvesting.com. And newbie is spelled N-E-W-B-I-E. -E. I'll be sure to link to that as well as... Uh... A lot of other stuff that we've talked about here in this conversation in the show notes for this episode at retipster.com forward slash 104 is this is episode 104. Yeah, Ryan, appreciate you coming on the uh, the podcast and talking to me about this. It's been really interesting. And um, yeah, if you guys want to learn more, by all means, go check out his website. And uh, yeah, keep me posted on how it's going, Ryan. Thanks again, Seth. And I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Absolutely. Thanks, man.